Today we are going to discuss about calcific tendonitis. As you've probably seen in the previous videos, this condition is actually part of a huge condition which started from shoulder impingement and moving on to the subacromial impingement which will subsequently develop into a rotator cuff tear or a calcific tendonitis and for the rotator cuff tear it will end up with the rotator cuff arthropathy well for each of those videos i for each of those topics i've made separate videos and this video will focus on the calcific tendonitis well let's move on with the basics first off this condition is usually seen in an elderly population of the age of around 30 to 60 more common in women and it is also seen with certain risk factors such as patients presenting with diabetes or hypothyroidism well the calcification itself comes around the tendon and intratendinous and it is usually situated around the rotator cuff insertion site with the supraspinatus being the most commonly involved tendon. It is frequently associated with the subacromial impingement and the relation with any etiological form is unknown and therefore this condition can occur spontaneously without any known cause. For the pathoanatomical stage, usually the key molecular pathways that, involve, that are involved is the catepsin K, the osteopontin, or any other signaling molecules. But usually the stages can be divided into three stages, with each of these stages having their own symptoms. During the pre-calcific stage, usually we can see a metaplasia. Metaplasia meaning that there's a change of one cellular form to the other. And the tendineus underwent fibrocartilaginous metaplasia and during this stage patient remains pain free and next would be the calcific stage calcific stage is where you usually meet your patient calcific stage could be subdivided into the formative phase where there is usually cell mediated calcific deposits during which period of time the patient may present with pain or without pain now during the resting phase Usually there lacks inflammation or vascular infiltration and there may be or no pain. And finally, during the resorptive phase, there will be phagocytic resorption of the lesion itself and there will be vascular infiltration and therefore inflow of any inflammatory cells and its signaling pathway. And usually in this stage, patient felt most painful. And at the end spectrum of this disease, there will be a post-calcific stage. Now, the classification of this condition can be divided by uh, according to several authors. The first is by Gardner and Heyer, which divides this calcific tendinitis condition into three types according to the shape size of the lesion. For the type 1, the lesion would be well circumscribed with dense calcification. For type 2, there should be a soft contour or dense or sharp or transparent lesion. For the type 3, the lesion should be translucent and slightly cloudy without any clear circumscription. And this is usually e equals the resorptive phase where the lesion is gradually being resorbed. And next, the other classification that is proposed is by Mole. Mole has classified the classific tendinitis into four types, type A, B, C, and D. Once again, based on how the lesion looks on the x-rays. And then we could also see when you have mastered the basics, you are able to raise the diagnosis plainly first by taking a good history taking. Usually the pain comes without any precedent trauma and patient may come with symptoms such as catching or crepitus around the shoulder and sometimes there may be a blocking, mechanical blocking of the shoulder motion. While on the physical finding, usually under inspection, you could see a atrophy of the muscle, especially the supraspinatus. Since the muscle is in a pathological state, the people would gradually decrease the use of the muscle and therefore 
cause atrophy of the muscle. For the motion itself, there could be decreased range of motion along with dyskinetic motion of the scapula and also decrease in the rotator cuff strength. There are several tests that could provoke this condition. One of it is the subacromial impingement sign. Well, after you have done all of those, you still will need additional examination because the condition is called calcific tendonitis, then you could see calcific deposits around the tendon. Calcium shall appear bright on plain radiograph and on certain views, you could see it very clearly such as this AP supraspinatus outlet and axillary view. You could see the supraspinatus very clearly. Here is the proximal humerus and this is the insertion site of the supraspinatus tendon and you can see calcifications all along the tendon. And next is the internal rotation view which could help you further visualize better the infraspinatus and teraspinal calcification and external rotation view which can help you identify the subscapularis calcification. Now, CT is rarely indicated in these cases and MRI usually can show that there should be low signal on all sequences because this is a calcific deposit and ultrasound usually will reveal hyperechoic lesion because the deposit is of calcium. Next, after you have mastered all the additional examination needed, then you can continue on with management of the patient. Well, basically you can manage every condition through non-operative and operative means. Non-operative means will be your first line of treatment and includes various types of modalities. The first would be definitely drugs and active lifestyle modification which include NSAIDs, physical therapy, stretching and strengthening. Medication may also proceed to the injection of steroid to the localized area. Now, during the formative and resting phase, note that this phase is frequently associated with or uh, with slightly pain. So, ESWL or uh, extracorporeal shock wave length is usually used in this stage and it is a very good adjunct treatment and is usually used in refractory calcific tendonitis in the formative and resting phase. You could lose high or low energy therapy for this and high energy in as compared to the low energy it usually has a different rate of calcific deposit resorption. Now for the resorptive phase you could use a more intervention a more intervening action such as the ultrasound guided needle barbotage where you actually use your needle to break the calcium deposits that has been formed followed by corticosteroid injections and this is all done under the guidance of ultrasound to localize the location of the calcific deposits needle lavage is also one of the technique to lavage the lesion itself now for the operative technique, there are certain indications which include symptom progression, refractory cases where non-operative options have failed, and if the lesion has indeed interfered with your activity of daily living. The technique shall include decompression of the calcium deposit. You could do it either using a mini open technique or arthroscopic technique. Well, following that, the post-management shall include evaluation of any complication that may arise which includes recurrency, persistent shoulder pain, shoulder stiffness or any aerotrogenic injury to the rotator cuff during operative treatment. Prognosis is generally a failure in non-operative treatment. Sorry, the prognosis is generally good in non-operative treatment with resolution of symptoms in 60 to 70 percent in six months and failure is usually due to bilateral or large calcification or there could be deposits underlying the anterior third of the acromion or deposits that extend medial to the acromion where these areas are really hard to reach during the surgery 
Well, that is all regarding the calcific tendonitis. I hope you could watch the next part of video, which is the rotator cuff, tear, and also the rotator cuff arthropathy. Or if you have not watched the previous video leading to this condition, which is the subacromial impingement, you can find it in the playlist in my YouTube channel, Orthopedic Tutor. Thank you for watching.